when you look in the mirror and when you go to sleep, um, how comfortable are you with your conscience? And I think for the, like the question of fairness, um, everybody needs to walk their own moral path. And I'm okay with my moral path. And the reason that I, I, I can sleep at night and I feel okay in terms of if, you know, we're talking about the, the not so pleasant aspects of, of the role of general management where, yeah, sometimes, you know, you have to make difficult decisions and things. I, I can only ever do that if I know full well that I've been fair and reasonable and that I've talked directly with with the people and try to do as much as possible that to avoid that situation. Mm. You know what I mean? But you can only do so much. You can only, what you know, the, um, take a horse to water and you can't make it drink, you know? Hello and welcome to Anatomy of a Leader show with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of HVO Search. Founders, CEOs and lone HR directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life, the failures they faced, what they wish they knew before they started, and the hurdles they had to overcome. If you want to be inspired, surprised, and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top, you're in the right place here on Anatomy of a Leader. Like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will change the way you think and may even change your life. Simon, thank you so much for coming on the Anatomy of a Leader show. Thank you so much for being here. And it's a shame that we have to speak over camera and not in person mm -hmm. because I've, you know, when you were living in London, it was just such a privilege to be, you know, to know you and to meet you. And, uh, but technology, at least we have that to be able to communicate. And I've known you for my whole career and followed your career for many, many years. How and long has it been? I was trying to think. At least 15 years. Yeah, at least. 15, 14 years, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I remember your days at Diesel, and then obviously going to JW Anderson. And um, I just like and respect you, and I think you're a really outspoken person who has an amazing work ethic and great ethics as well when it comes to business. And... Um, yeah, I would love to talk to you about your personal journey and the lessons you've learned. So I'd love to go to, to the beginning and talk about you growing up and what that was like for you and any special events or anything that has happened that has shaped the leader that you are today. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, it's an easy question to start with. <laughs> I don't like it. it's this. It's um, it's the it's like a, the psychology of how the the adult adult human is formed from the child version, right? Um, but I don't like. I'll come to the childhood, but like when you say leader, um, I don't know. I'm just. I've never been comfortable. Um, thinking of myself like a, of a leader or or what I really haven't never been comfortable with a title anything um everything I've ever done has just been a really on pure instinct um trying to be conscious and trying to be aware and trying to pick up from from people um and then just operating instinctively the second that I stop and think or try to like be too strategic or political or diplomatic about things is like I'm just like I'm frozen mm -hmm. like I just have to be instinctive and so yeah where that comes from god knows um but my like my childhood um I mean I was born and raised in Stoke-on-Trent which is a um I'm not sure if you're familiar with it but it's like let's say kind of like a typical small medium-sized Midlands, Northern city, 
with all of those political charges and feelings that boil inside it. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, gone from being a manufacturing city into being, I don't know what, like it's one of those cities that kind of like lost its heart um, Mm -hmm. and lost its soul during the change from the Thatcher years and things. Um, So like it wasn't a rough upbringing, but it was definitely, um, you know, just regular working class upbringing. My mum's from Stoke-on-Trent. My dad was from Moss Side, Manchester, old Irish Catholics that moved over uh, one or two generations back. And my dad grew up in a fish and chip shop in Moss Side, Manchester. Um, And because of the troubles that were going on during those days um, with the IRA, um, the Irish weren't looked too fondly in England. Do you know what I mean? So my dad was kind of like, he used to tell me this all the time. He was um, pigeonholed, you know, with, with the Irish were pigeonholed with the blacks and, and the, the, you know what I mean, all the other people of colour. And um, so my dad grew up um, as, a, as a white man, like with this very polarised, weird, you know, feeling about race um, and you know, the, 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 that kind of energy that goes around that. And so my bringing in Stoke was like a very small town, let's say mentality. But then my dad was like the most positive person in the world. And, and he always used to say to us, like, the world is, is massive and Stoke on Trent's this big. And you like, you got to get out. Manchester used to take us to Manchester every week. Um, and like just to experience the cosmopolitan way of what a bigger city was and other ethnicities as well. My, my father was always big into that. Um, and so like, and then we had the regular upbringing, you know, very fortunate. I've got an older brother um, and we, 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 we grew up like within kind of a loving home, you know, every family has their own things and, and whatnot. Um, and my mum, there's a, there's a big element of, of my mother's life that definitely shaped me later on in life as a manager, as a general manager. My mum was a um, very simple, very humble um, person, so kind, one of the most generous kind people that you'll ever meet. Um, never really raised a voice ever. Um, and was also not so ambitious like she was just very happy being where she is you know and my father he was more ambitious and he was more of a go-getter and I guess he had social mobility from growing up in Moss Side which was the most dangerous place in the UK at that time um to being having a decent job as a sales manager and, and things like this and we lived not in the city centre in the in the down areas of Stoke we looked like in a you know decent working class home and things like this um and then they split up and something like happened in my really formulative years as a teenager where our parents um got divorced and uh i went personally i went off the rails um and what do you mean by that uh just being involved in things that you probably shouldn't be involved in um and like one or two dangerous situations also and um and like on in hindsight it's all just like you know wanting attention because you the nucleus of your family home home is is being completely decimated um and yeah and then also like my, my, my brother during that time which have been um open about in terms of advocacy for mental health he um, had a breakdown and we had no no idea what was going on. It was like six months, six months process um, where he just completely deteriorated and ended up in being sectioned and he was in a mental ward for almost two years. Um, so it was a really, it was a shattering from being quite a smooth start, like start up until being 15, 16 years of age. 
I also also thought I was going to be a footballer, like we're with we're, we're football mad family. Mm-hmm. And I, I just up until the age of 15, 16, there was nothing else in my mind that was that would that was going to stop me being a footballer at all. Like I was always the captain of every team, everything. Um, I played for the county, Staffordshire. I was the captain of Staffordshire County. I played for for um, the youth teams of Port Vale, which is like a, you know a professional club in the second division or something. And but then I got injured, um, and yeah, never thought anything about business or fashion or anything. However, like the people that I grew up with, our like our nucleus, the guys, the lads that I'd, like I would. Um, hang around with we were always very much into clothes and the music scene and you know what I mean like even when we were 11 12 years old we were going to Manchester and Leeds and Birmingham Liverpool like looking for kit buying saving up and buying you know whatever Paul Smith and Comedy Gap even when mm. we were 12 years old so we've always been in like into the scene and a, 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 on reflection, probably, yeah, like on the front end of like what was happening culturally. Um, yeah. And then my mother, my mother, um, like spent her whole life working on a factory floor, basically. Um, and she, my mother's been, as, as much as the very, like, positive very like energy positive energy like my father you know always used to say you know what I mean look into people's eyes don't judge on anything else just always look into the eyes and you'll be able to read the energy um it, it, it like these things always stuck with me as much as my father was very much like a, a, an enormous influence and voice very quite a loud voice into me um my mother, on the other hand, was very, a, a really soft, quiet voice. And it was only really later in life when I began to mature, I guess, into my mid, late 30s. Because my father passed away 15 years ago. My mother passed away a couple of years ago. Um, like during that period after my, after my father died, it really, like I was a lot closer to my mother. And she, like her influence in terms of a, like a business perspective, like she always used to tell me all the stories of the managers that she's had that would only come around on the shop floor and introducing, you know what I mean? The clients and things like that Mm -hmm. would only ever show that they cared when they've got somebody to, to bring around, do you know what I mean? And so my mother would, would explain to me what makes her and what makes her colleagues respect or not respect the people the managers that she was so-called reporting to, if you know what I mean. Mm. And that was, you know what I mean, that, that like, I literally, the, the, the counsel of my mother, just from being on the, on the shop, I just, and I, even, even now, like, I, I just think, how would I like my mother to be treated? <laughs> you know what mm. I mean? Like, that's always for me, like, a, a, especially when it comes to very, very difficult decisions and, you know, discipline and all of these things and all restructuring and, and these things. Mm. It's like, when you look at the lens of, or look through the lens of imagine if that was your mother, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's not to say that, you know, difficult things and you can't have difficult conversations, but there's a certain empathy and compassion that you can... That you can there's always a There's always a better way of delivering a message, even if it's a difficult one. And I think what you're saying is, you know, okay, business is business and you have to make certain decisions, but still you're dealing with people. And if it's a difficult conversation, it doesn't have to be cold. And that, you know, if you're thinking that it's your mother at the end of it, like how would you handle that situation? I mean, the decision at the end of it may still be the same, but how you deal with it could be completely different. And, Mm. you know, the relationships at the end of the day is, is what makes the mm. world go round mm. but that's, that's and i think that made when you when you start to become 
a general manager and you you know you have to deal with this you have to deal with these things all the time i think um my experience when i first started to deal with these things probably um just because you're nervous and, and you're inexperienced, you know what I mean? Like you, 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 you make mistakes and you're probably not yourself and you probably don't have the, um, like reservoir of experience to draw on to make sure that the dignity and the respect of the, of the human being on the other side of the table, you know what I mean? Is, is, is always kept. And I think that's just, just super important, you know, Unless they've done something bad, obviously, you know what I mean. Then, like, that's different. Um, but generally, then who do you imagine like, that you're speaking to? <laughs> what do you mean? So, if they've done something bad, okay, you know, you wouldn't be probably thinking it's your mother at the end of it. But like, who do you imagine that you're talking to? Uh, I don't imagine anything else. I'm just looking at that person, mm. and I'm thinking, like, what has made you do that mm. um then i don't see my mother because i don't like feel my mum probably would never do something like that and exactly. then it's just like, like actually that's when i think that's when a protective instinct personally comes into me and i think oh, how <laughs> fucking dead like you know what i mean i take it very personally you know, because I think it's it's part of a, of, a, of a general manager's role to make sure that all of the human beings are protected and safe. Um, do you know what I mean? And, 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 and are treated fairly. And so when, if there's ever a circumstance where any one individual um, goes outside of that parameter, that's when, you know, nice Simon isn't so nice. And it's like... This interesting concept of fairness and, you know, it seems like that's something that's really important to you. Where do you think that comes from? Um, I, 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 I don't, I don't know precisely um, because I don't, I don't know precisely. I think um, the question of fairness is, the question of fairness is, is also like in terms of the morals that you want to keep. You know what I mean? Like how, like when you look in the mirror and when you go to sleep, um, how comfortable are you with your conscience? And I think for the, like the question of fairness, um, everybody needs to walk their own moral path. And I'm a okay with my moral path. And the reason that I, I, I can sleep at night and I feel okay in terms of if, you know, we're talking about the, the not so pleasant aspects of, of the role of general management where, yeah, sometimes, you know, you have to make difficult decisions and things. I, I can only ever do that if I know full well that I've been fair and reasonable and that I've talked directly with, with the people and tried to do as much as possible that, to avoid that situation. Mm. You know what I mean? But you can only do so much. You can only, you know, the, um, take a horse to water and you can't make it drink, you know? Um, so fairness I don't know I remember if you want to talk on a psychological level uh, I just like psychology <laughs> <laughs> I'm like going back in time I, I just I remember um, my dad was like Superman to me like he was massive influence in my life and one night he came home and he was crying and it was the first time that I saw my dad cry. And it was like, I didn't recognize who this fragile person was in front of me. I'd seen my mom cry before, but I'd never seen my dad. And it was really weird. And it, it, it's a horrible story, but he ran over a dog by accident. And this dog just ran out and he knocked this dog over. And I just remember saying, it's not fair. And this, like, the, this guy who was walking a dog with his, with his son, and the son was crying and they were crying. And, you know, it was a total accident. And I just remember my dad crying and saying, it's not fair. It's just like, it's not fair. And I... How did you feel seeing your dad cry? Uh, I, I just loved him even more. 
because we're all human at the end. I'll start crying in a minute. This is also like people who've worked with me know I'm like. Do you cry? And ah, I'm crying all the time. <laughs> Somebody does something good, I'm crying. Or I'm, we have private meetings. But you, you ask any general manager, you ask any whatever, anybody that's kind of responsible for people. Half the time you're spending, <laughs> half the time you're spending with people who just want to let out their emotions, and and half the time that ends ends in tears. Like a lot of the private conversations that you have inside a inside an office, you'll know that from from you know on the HR side of recruitment mm -hmm. it's extremely emotional because people people keep a front people keep a front up and think that they've got to put the good face on they've got to go to work and be superman and all these things and then when it gets to hr or when it gets to the management you know the, the, all the guards come down and it's just this like uh, release of emotions um mm. so you know, we can definitely put on this face can't, can't we when we're working where we have to appear that we know everything, we know how to do it, you know, we're strong, we can handle it. But actually not, you know, we don't know everything and we can't handle everything and life happens. There's a, and I think that that's a, um, it's, it's a common, in my opinion, it's a common um, mistake that a lot of people do especially like when they get promoted or they go into this role for the first time they start acting unnaturally mm -hmm. i did it i've done it myself and it's out of nerves and it's out of inexperience whereas the wise thing to do is to speak to people who have done it do you know what i mean always remember to be yourself like because you, you you are what makes you nobody else can be you you know so you have to use the, the your unique traits um to your strength and your advantage and i think uh, like a, a lot of the things in in work and personally a lot with what i try to do and i think it's very important in building a team um building a team who have the courage to be candid with each other and can be challenging but in a professional and empathetic way um is like to just let people be free. And I always say to people, if you feel it in your belly button, say it. Mm -hmm. If you feel if you feel anything in your belly button, everybody knows that feeling when you're thinking, like, oh God, oh, do I should I say that or not? I'm nervous to say that. Or mm -hmm. you know, bloody say it. Because nothing, nobody can challenge what you feel. They can disagree or you know what I mean, but nobody can invalidate your feelings. So you've got to be able to be um, free and, and speak. And me, honestly, I, I don't keep up any. I don't keep up. Has that any always been the case? I mean, anymore. you've you've said earlier that you know you 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 were like that before, and then you just stopped. Was there a particular moment when you stopped sort of pretending and acting? Did something happen at that point where you where you thought you know what? There's just no point in doing that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it, I don't know if honestly you could describe it like as pretending because you because you you know you're doing your best with what you know at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I was definitely never like pretending in anything that I've done. Um, it's it's more just like having the instinctive ability to completely be yourself, and that's that's just a slight nuance in terms of pretending, or mm -hmm. um, and that that comes with experience. And I guess I think. Probably on reflection, like the first year or so at JDB Anson. Um, because the, the thing is, when you become a CEO, there's two different routes to be a CEO, isn't there? One is like you do the management consultant route and you get trained, and you know what I mean? You, you like you, you may have some experience or whatever, but generally you come from a, an academic background of being a general manager. So you've got that helicopter 360 view. Or you come through the working route where you become a specialist in one individual pillar. You know what I mean? And then as you get older, you take on more responsibilities and you you get experience in two or three different um, disciplines as well. But then when you become a CEO for the first time, um, you're not an expert in what you do. And that's a massive chasm that just it's nobody can prepare you from whichever way. Because you, if you come from the academic route, you don't have the experience and you're dealing with people fundamentally. And the higher you go, you're dealing with the politics of people and the egos of people and all of these things. So, like, it's that's a, it's just a massive chasm that you that anybody who becomes a CEO um, needs to 
tread. And there's a lot of people who fall down that chasm and there's uh, people who do take to it quicker or more naturally or what. And for me, yeah, I, I don't know. It probably, I'm still learning now, by the way. I don't class myself as, like I said, I don't think I'm a leader. I'm just like trying to help people, trying to move the business on and, mm-hmm. you know, trying to, trying to, trying to make the, the best situ- situation and make sure that we're safe and that we're going in the right direction and, you know, all the other things. Um, I'd like to come back to you on on sort of the first CEO role and leadership, but just going back to what we're talking about in terms of not acting per se, and you know we're talking about it's not really pretending, but being yourself and expressing yourself without you know kind of holding things back and without having that sort of facade, and you know where where you felt that actually you've 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 pretty much have been doing that already and sort of expressing your emotions how do you feel that has impacted your work and your perception of you being a leader within those businesses was it positive was it negative you know what have been your experiences well i think uh in I mean, J.W. Anderson was different anyway, as any role, because also, to, like, the dynamic with the, 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 the entrepreneur and the founder of the business, you know, this is also important because the personality of that person, um, as, a, as a CEO, yes, you've got your own personality, but you also need to blend with the personality, um, and it's not up to really the entrepreneur or the founder to change himself, I, 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 I would feel more so it's up to the, to the CEO or the general manager, yes, to keep their own personality and approach, but also to mold themselves into the culture of um, the, that situation and that business, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, with, with Jonathan, he's so, I mean, it's amazing. You know, it's just like the most, it's, it's, it's incredible um, on a creative level, but even more than that, like on a very entrepreneurial um, level, um, it, it, it was really a lot more on the operational side, especially in the beginning, then more so on the strategic side together and with the senior team, the, you know, the directors inside the business. And But in the early like part of that, the first year when I don't, I on reflection, because I'm ve- extremely self-critical. I keep a, a mirror above where I sit, like, and, and it always makes me consciously think and always to be very self-critical so that you're, you're, you're trying to assess the, the small elements that you think that you could and should be doing better or differently. And so when I look back on that period, yeah, probably the, the, the first year, um, I just wasn't acting as instinctively as I could. As, I just wasn't really operating as me. And it took a year f- or so for that to come out. And so during that time, it probably, I don't know if people had the greatest impression of me. I don't know. I've never really also thought about that, mm. to be honest. I, mm. Not that I don't care. Of course, everybody cares, but I don't know. I've not. That's not never been in, in any of my thought process of, what do these people think of me? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's wrong or right. God knows, but you know, um, yeah. Well, I think there's one thing, I mean, of course, you know, when you're saying, well, I don't care or I do, I mean, we, we all are social creatures. It's important for us to be able to be part of a community and to be understood. But at the same time, when you are acting out of, instinct what you believe is right you know you are not kind of watching over your shoulder and it's like oh what do they think if I do this or if I do this what are they going to think you have your own direction and your own view of how to do things and yeah I think it's it, it's interesting to see how that plays out within a work environment and this is the conversation that I've had in terms of well you know as a founder or as a CEO you know your role is to be the vision holder and to you know, to kind of lead the team and, you know, to set the the direction of where everyone is going and to kind of keep up that, um, 
you know, that, that vision alive, even when other things are so uncertain. And when you're wavering or you're kind of taking too much other opinion on board and you'll seem uncertain in that, then that becomes much more difficult to then get people to believe in the direction that you're going in. And having that self-belief and, you know, having that kind of idea of, you know, I'm doing things because I believe they're right, um, you know, that, that, that is something that's very important. Mm. It, it, it is in my mind I'm just thinking there's there's there's, there's horses for courses isn't there you know what I mean like it's all it depends on the scale of the business depends on the personality of the founder entrepreneur what involvement they have in the business whether that's a holistic one across all levels or just purely creative or or what depends culturally depend you know what I mean like whether you're Italian, Scandinavian, American, British, or what, we all, we all have have these like um, cultural traits generally of like how we're operating in a business environment. So it all it all depends. I think um, I would hope, or what people have said to me over the years is that I, I, I and also because I've lived in different countries. Um, I could I can be malleable and be agile in terms of a cultural point of view of of the team that you're working with, and it's important because then in terms of the democracy of taking decisions, um, or how and when to just like make the decision, you know what I mean, like like singularly, um, or how much time and who you involve to get on side. There's a lot. There's a lot of nuances in that and there is, I think it all depends on what type of decisions and mm. and what you know what I mean it depends on what the potential consequences of the decision are there's no you know what I mean me I definitely um, swing a lot more on the democratic side you know what I mean but I'm also conscious that if this is taking too long and I can anticipate that there's going to be a consequential effect of that fuck it I'll just make the decision like what do you want you know like, but I think um, in, in I think it, it's it's only respectful. Um, and if if you're building a team that you really want to perform, then they need to be empowered. And to be empowered means being really involved in the decisions. Mm-hmm. No. Um, What's the hardest but, thing about leading a team? <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, it's that easy. <laughs> it, of course, it's the bloody people, you know. But that, that's also the most beautiful thing, um, you know. It's it's because if um, if if we were you know playing chess or whatever, like if you're moving pieces of paper around, that's fine. But when you're not. People are irrational creatures. We're all emotional. It doesn't matter what size of business, where that, where it's located, what sector it's in or what. You're dealing with human beings. Mm-hmm. And human beings don't have linear motivations. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're all very extremely complex creatures and, 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 and some are motivated whatever some motivated by pride and vanity or greed or selflessness or or what so like that's the most complex part about um being a leader because what what is like i say i'm never comfortable with this leader thing (laughs) anyway like for me it's managing people and making sure that we all know where we're going and that we get there and it's good when we get there you know i'm I'm, that's a leader now I'm a very, uh, maybe, but like I say, I, get, I just, I don't know. I just get very, un, I get very uncomfortable when I'm forced to think about that. And I get very uncomfortable when um, I'm forced to come out of a very natural, fast move. I like, I, I like to work fast. I like to, you know, just move and get things done. And so I, I just become uncomfortable when um, like, forced to stop and reflect from an outside point of view on what that is if you know what i mean mm-hmm. uh, that's not to say that we don't stop 
um, in the in the business process of assessing where we are from a financial point of view or or where we need to go on a strategic level. But that for me is different. That for me is part of the flow, um, the flow of 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 creating something. And I think like when we're on this like this path also like um and especially in fashion we talk about like the 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 split and the difference between the creative and the the business person do you know what i mean as if they're totally binary as if it's completely one zero one or the other yeah and in 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 my opinion especially when you're sculpting and you've got a vision of a of a organization um in mind, I find that an extremely creative process. So I, I feel personally like I'm in a in, and it's a different creative process than a design or you know anything from that perspective, anything from let's say more a traditional artistic perspective. But I think that there's something uh, very creative about visualizing the kind of organization and 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 place that you and team that you visualize and therefore and then you put the plans in your mind to build do you, i don't know if this makes sense well there's different ways of being creative isn't that so you know you can be creative and sort of design but then you can be creative in business it's about connecting the dots in different ways and looking at a problem in a different way so so that makes sense I mean, what, what, talking about the relationship between the CEO and, say, a founder and a particularly a creative founder, what do you think are the most important things to for that relationship? Trust. And how do you build that? Um, I don't know. It's like in your personal life. Again, we're all human beings, isn't it? Um, you know what I mean? Like, why do you trust me and why do I trust you? But it's a feeling, isn't it? You know? Well, and, and I'm actually bringing that, in a guest feeling, soon, <laughs> talking what? about trust. Mm. Yeah, that feeling's built then. First of all, it's it's innate. It's an innate feeling. And then um, the more that you go on, then, of course, it's compounded. The trust is compounded by, by what you do and how you support each other and how you protect each other. Um, and the quality of the work that you're doing. Um, for me, that's what it. That's 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 ultimately what every single relationship comes down to: mm. trust and respect. Um, and I guess, in a in a weird way, um, the the respect and admiration for somebody who is doing something that you really probably can't do. Mm-hmm. Because, you know what I mean, you can't, not one person can do every single thing, so. For me, um, that's the most important thing. I mean, obviously, aside from trust, is understanding the different roles that each has to play and recognizing what the strengths are and then allowing the other person to do what they're good at and to be a good team where you are complementary rather than trying to do the same thing. Mm. And then to be able to let go and allow the other person to do the role that they're there to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is where the trust yeah. kind of plays in. It, 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 it's the trust, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. to, to empower. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also never comes down to two people, it never comes down to one people, it never comes down to two people. You know what I mean? It's like, even whether that's on the more business side or more creative side, there's always a, a team around that that does different disciplines Mm -hmm. and that's to my point earlier of when you first become ceo and then suddenly like you've been an expert for 10 years 15 years 20 years whatever in one discipline maybe highly experienced in three or four disciplines and then suddenly you've got people of 25 different disciplines coming to you with problems solutions that you need to authorize or or what Mm -hmm. you know what i mean um, so it, it always comes down to um, an entire team of people, and that always that then comes into the scale of business what you've got. Because if you're in a small business, you know you've got people wearing different hats who are not that experienced. So then that's a, like it's it, 
it's all it's all complicated, isn't it? Yes, no, people definitely make life complicated, even, you know, for themselves. <laughs> if we can figure out how not to do that, then we'll all that, massively evolve. We, 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 I remember a beautiful human being inside LV Mates called Pascal Jouvin. And I remember this talk. We, like, we used to get um, the guys from LV Mates sometimes to, to, to come and do, like we did these open days with, with the team at Jerry Benson. And, um, he gave this talk, and I always remember it. And he was talking about like the unconscious elements of of learning, like what do we um, what do we know and what what we don't know, and like the experience of a person. And again, you put this guard up and you you put this wall up. And when you first start out in your career, you don't like to say that you don't know. Mm-hmm. You just take on whatever, and you think that's going to be all right. And sometimes that also leads to burnout or or, or you know, different things, and and definitely leads to mistakes and things because you're so um, worried to just say I don't know exactly how to do that, or that's actually too much for me, and you're not you don't feel comfortable or confident enough to put a boundary on how much um, you've got on your plate at that moment, mm-hmm. and then you get scared because you you realise that you can't deliver it and you don't say anything because you're just so scared, and then it just compounds. And it compounds, and that's mm-hmm. the case when a lot of people in the early 20s are starting out, one of the biggest um, issues. And actually, one of the most underrated thing is when you do admit that, first of all, it's just a release, so you don't have to keep on putting up that facade on. And actually, the biggest win is to be able to just get it off your chest Mm. Because I think holding on to it is what makes it more difficult rather Mm. than just to express it. And Mm. you don't even need practical help or even solutions. Sometimes just the simple act of saying it already makes 90% of the difference. (laughs) Yep. And I say that knowing that intellectually, and yet I still don't follow that advice most of the time myself. Mm. And I think this is what's so fascinating about people. Like, even if you know what to do, you just don't always do it. But that's why I, I think um, the, the role of, like, the, the general manager is to set the um, tone of how the culture is. And, like, how do you want people to be expressing themselves and how free you want them to and I think that that's one of the most important things that you can get. And it's one of the most important things that um, builds a high performing team because it, when people can speak freely um, and just get things off the chest, that's one thing. The next step is then having that um, um, security of trust in each other that we can say these things, not be judged, but then also challenge each other and know that you're not challenging it from a political point of view to score points or make sure that you get above ahead of this one. That for me is like one of the worst things. Just to, like I'm, I'm super easy going, but that shit and politics and gossiping all that, like I'm, I'm that, no, 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 no. That's, uh, <laughs> we stopped that like straight away, you know? What um, happened when you, I mean, you must have been in, in, in situations and environments and cultures that were like that. Mm. How did you deal with that? Um, it's like any game of chess, no? Like you, 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 you've got to, you just always anticipating, um, what's going on and what's going to happen next. And then, you know, try to ensure that, you know what I mean? You're, and it happens in big companies. It happens again. Like it's, it's, um, the human beings are very complex and in the, the, even the bigger com- company or like the, the, the bigger, the amount of people in the team, then it's not dealing just with like, unconscious learning and 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 like people like forming the structure of a team and all of these things the structure is already there because you've got the resources what it becomes is actually navigating the politics and having people truly working for each other and not against each other mm-hmm. you know what i mean so there's there's at any scale of business it's there's different 
challenges that pose itself. You know what I mean? They're not more difficult. They're just very, very different um, challenges. But I, 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 the more complex it is, like I me, mean, I'm an extremely simple person. You just like, and this goes back to playing football. This goes back to being in sport. You know what I mean? If you've got a team and one or two are against the other ones and, you know, talking about this, you can't have that. You just can't have it. So they have got, they've got to be on board or they've got to get out. It's that simple. Because the longer that goes on, whichever scale of business you are, um, it's going to have a detrimental effect to the team performing at its, at its highest capability, you know? It's funny you say you don't, you feel uncomfortable that you are seen as a leader or labelled as a leader. And yet, you know, being captain of football teams, you know, several CEO roles under your belt, general manager. I mean, what do you, what does leadership mean to you? What does being leader mean? Um, uh, I don't know. Like instinctively, the first things that come into my mind um, is ultimately uh, the duty of care that you've got for the people to make sure that, um, we, like, we, the, the 100% of the business or 95% of the business is, is protected, safe for the next, not only year, but the next five year. You know what I mean? Like the foreseeable future is safe, first and foremost. Um, and then leadership... Never asking somebody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself fundamentally. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and then it's, 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 it's the team making sure that people feel good and have the resources to, to, to work together to do whatever they need to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then that's also setting the objectives, isn't it? Because, one thing is having a team working and all like, I mean, it's not to say being nice. It, it's actually the best form of a team is when people can trust each other, but challenge each other. That's the best form of a team. There's different phases, isn't there? It's like, you don't, you don't trust like, in, and you've got this gossiping or whatever. Then you've got the phase where actually, yeah, okay, we try and be nice with each other and blah, 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 blah. But you're not really performing because you need to rely on each other. You need the, you need the tension, but you need that in a, in a safe and trusting capacity. And so I think um, that's a huge element of, of leadership is, um, is, is bringing that team together with a common vision, but, but fundamentally having the culture that they're, that they're together in it and that everybody's rowing in the same boat. Because if it's, it's the not, element, no, right. it's the psychological safety aspect where totally. you feel that you're going to be heard, that your opinion matters, even if it doesn't go, it doesn't agree with the consensus. And even if the senior person above you, you know, is having one sort of, you know, vision or idea that you can still challenge that and that your opinion will still be heard and assessed and given proper thought. Totally. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the opinions, it's also, like in, in, in business, like in sport, you've got a team, you've got a goalkeeper, defense, midfield, attack, da da da, da. In business, it's the same. You've got the back end, you've got the operational back end, you know, side of things, through to the whatever, product development or, or service development or whatever, through to design, sales, marketing, da da, da. And everyone is reliant on each other. None is more important than, than, than any of the others. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 like in, in, in the team being able to rely on each other, and if you've got high standards, there's one thing just like being okay with things and being okay standards. I can't do that. I just can't do it. I, I, like, I, I don't know. There's just something that's like, if you're going to do something, and this could definitely comes from my father. Like, if you're going to do it's uber competitive, mm. beyond competitive, like I take it very personally. It's just like respect when other companies or whatever do things. But like, uh, oh my god, 
it just drives me insane when when like you you know that you could have done better um and so like that psychological safety um the the, the highest form of that psychological safety is when um one department is saying to the other department that's not good enough for me i'm ready with this you're delivering it to me late you're delivering it to me with this missing or di- like whatever it is you know what I mean? And that not becoming some kind of war from an HR perspective, it's actually like, yep, yeah, I've got it. You're right. Next time I'm on it. That's the, the wow. That's when you That's when you know that the team is, boop, 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 boop. Mm. You know? Well, as you said, everyone relies on everyone else. You know, it's a team for a reason. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. it's not, it's not easy to get that. That's, that's what the general manager, you know, ultimately has that's the situation that ultimately that they need to cultivate and cultivate with private individual conversations cultivating team meetings you know what i mean to to actually cultivate that environment that people can challenge each other from a professional point of view nothing personal mm-hmm. and, and on the recipient's end understand and trust why that cha- why that professional challenge has happened mm-hmm. very different than a personal challenge or you know what i mean because that obviously that's not good that 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 can become toxic, but if the if the psychological safety in the team is there, that you can challenge each other professionally to go to a different level, on an interdepartmental level, which everybody is relying on, then you can then 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 wow, that's amazing. That's it's like an element of creative tension as well to be able to, you know, if everyone just agrees with everything, there's no progress. And if there is, you know, there's always someone who has has thought of something that everyone else hasn't, which mm-hmm. is why having diverse teams that feel that they can raise their voices and speak up makes such a difference. Because, you know, if you've got eyes 360 degrees around, you're going to be able to see way more than mm-hmm. if everyone's just looking, you know, straight ahead. Mm-hmm. So so having that team performing in such a way is 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 really optimal. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk a little bit more about sort of personal things. And it's not something that I have asked men very often, but I know you've very recently, well, recently, not very recently, had a baby. Mm. And just wondering how that has changed or shaped how you view your life and business. Um, I don't I don't think it's changed my view or how I feel about business like I, I've always no I, I, I don't think it has I thought like I say I've always mm-hmm. my approach um, it's definitely in the last decade moving more into like general manager positions is um, is, is, is always been empathetic um, simply because of my relationship with my mother and always like trying to um, process things through that lens of how that, like if, if, if you know, you, how your mother would feel if you're doing something. And so having a baby for me is, um, doesn't change anything in my approach. Changes obviously a lot of things in my personal life, but in terms of business, it, it doesn't because I, I I would always be totally um, respectful and understanding of whatever anybody is going through on a on a family level, mm-hmm. um, and some people don't have babies and some people don't um, want families, but they have very very different things that mean equally as much to them in their life and their ambitions of their life. Um, so they deserve. Uh, equal, you know, respect and understanding for whatever they're going through. And I always said that, well, it, 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 I don't know, some of the like things that I always fall back on, the morals or the values that I fall back on, I always say the same thing to to people if I'm going to work somewhere or with people or, or what. It's like, um, for me, the most important thing is the health and the family. That's the number one thing. This transcends any business. And nobody is more or less equal in any way in, in, in these things. So what's for sure is that in business, in life, the people 
at any given moment, 20% of, the, of, of your team has got very severe health and or family issues going on. And often only you know that, or the HR. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So um, you, you, to, to, to be, to manage people, um, that's something that you need to, to take on and feel decent about taking that on because it's not, it's not a light thing. It's heavy when other people don't know about it and then they're wondering why this one's got time off or this one's got this or this one's got that. But again, that comes into the trust that you that you develop and that you earn um, with the team because then if you've got that as a baseline barometer that everybody's equal when it comes to the health in the family, then everybody knows that if and when they have problems or their family has issues, they're also taken care of. Mm -hmm. So then... In, and in a weird way, and I, 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 I like one of my f f earlier mentors, like I, I, I don't only learn this also through my relationship with my um, mother, but one of my early mentors um, when I was working at uh, DKMY in New York, just before my father passed away, the way that she handled um, that situation with me was like, like I, I, I with with really good friends still now, you know, over 15 years later, Mary Wang, she's amazing. And I would run through a brick wall for her. Mm. And this is what happens when you have someone who has treated you with such decency and understanding and empathy and giving you the time to be able to process that and just really being there, you know, psychologically it's like it's a bond, isn't it? It creates such a bond and so oh, much trust. Very deep, very profound. Yeah. Because generally people want to work. Generally people, like, they, 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 you don't get, you make get a lazy person, let's be honest. You get the lazy person and then it's up, it's up to the manager to figure that out. Do they either get on board or they, or they, or you have to, they had to jump ship or you have to, you have to say goodbye, you know? Mm -hmm. But generally people just want to work. Like you don't meet a lot of people that, that come and they're just like, no, actually, I don't even want to do a job. I'm very happy just sitting here. You know, so if, if, if you provide the resources for them and provide the safety for them, like a lot, a lot of the fundamentals are already done. You know, it can be. I think we could um, – I think there's a lot that can be overcomplicated. And I think uh, through sometimes people who go into these roles um, – when you don't have the experience of that or the instinctive feelings of it, you can overcomplicate things and make it too too much of what it is when actually you just need to make sure that if you get most of the basics right, a lot of other things just kind of like click into, All into click place. In place. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm. Looking, looking back on your career now, what do you think, if you had known it then, would have saved you a lot of hassle now? Um, no, I'm laughing because the quickest thing that came into mind was pivot tables. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also technical skills that you learn along the way, isn't there? You know what I mean? I, I remember, like, it used to take me bloody ages to do these Excel reports when I was about 21. And then there was a whiz kid in the office, and he told me, I got him to teach me pivot tables. And, like, wow, for a few years, like, my life was different. So I think the... Uh, inquisitive nature to get extra technical skills at an early age is going to is going to accelerate you definitely um what was the question maria what uh if you had known it then what would have saved you a lot of hassle now probably um, I don't know. It's a difficult question to answer. Just, um, probably the emotional intelligence to truly um, see things from different people's perspectives. Um, yeah, the, the 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 empathy and the emotional intelligence. Because I think probably myself during my twenties, I was still very much kind of like influenced by my father. Um, and was just go get it running, you know, doing this and you know what I mean. But like, I, I was, I, um, 
I was always respectful of other departments, but I was also also like, I don't know, you just kind of like wanted these things done. You wanted everybody to be at the same standard so that you could progress like your area of the business and but you rely on other people and sometimes um like the frustration of that on in hindsight um is probably ha from having a limited uh i don't want to say shallow but like yeah like a, you know a limited emotional intelligence and i think as you get older especially when you're managing people and managing people of different disciplines um the emotional intelligence is really crucial. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To see, because like what a finance person thinks is extremely different than what a designer thinks. And so this the is the ability to place yourself into someone else's shoes. Hundred percent, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and on a managerial level, you need that from a personal level to understand what that person is going through personally and what motivates them. You know what I mean? I always ask people, I don't ask people what they want to do for the next two years. I ask them what they want on their epitaph. Like I ask them what they want to do in their life, what legacy they want to leave. I, so one is like understanding the personal ambition of um, of the person. But then also what I, what I mean in answer to your question is from the very professional point of view of seeing things from the perspective of that department, which because like I came through you know, the discipline of, of sales, commercial development, then marketing, and then, you know, the brand building, different things. Like I came through a, um, uh, like isolated route as opposed to a general management route. And so on reflection now, um, the, yeah, the emotional intelligence to be able to see things from a professional perspective. Because mm. uh, it, I, when I was 25 years old, I thought the sales department was the most important thing because if you don't sell things, you ain't got no money coming in. <laughs> I don't think you're far away from the truth, though. Oh, uh, you, you couldn't be further from the truth. Really? So what is So be, what is it? There isn't. Every single one is equally as important. Mm. Every single one. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So you can have the most incredible sales, design, this, 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 production, finance, da, da, da. But then if there's one aspect of that chain that is broken mm. or is a link, what's going to happen? You know, the relay race is going to go around and then somebody's going to drop the baton. And it, it, it doesn't matter who starts well. Or the, it matters that the entire team finishes well and gets to where they're going. Do you know what I mean? Mm. The when when and a, a lot that's one I give to 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 you know to, if I was giving advice to my 22 24 26 year old self um you stole my next question oh really <laughs> <laughs> go for it <laughs> um, it's like to always understand things from the other department's point of view it's not even a personal thing it's like the actual department which everybody has to do in, in, in any business unless you're very you know isolated doing a research study and you're in a you know in your room alone for 24 hours a day um but any other business that's operating especially on a product level um you're reliant on the finance team you're reliant on production team you're on merchandise you're on design you're, you know you you you're reliant so and every single one is of equal importance on the basis that the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You're right. You're hundred percent right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So a lot, I think a lot of, of, of um, like kids just starting out on their careers and professional journey. Um, that's one aspect that, because it's a natural instinct to want to be good and be successful and want to um, accomplish things in what you are doing in your individual role and your individual department. And maybe then in a few years time, you get to be the manager of that department and like your little, like the celebrations and things that you have and the accomplishments that you have are often only spoken about inside that team and that department. So you're, you're like for the first 10 years, you're in this cocoon of a sales department or a finance department or this. And so you kind of like grow up with this, um, 
resilience mm -hmm. against the other departments, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense in, in any way, mm -hmm. you know, because then when you when you become general manager or you're like you you know you 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 have this like helicopter view of all of the the, the departments and how um, intrinsically and viscerally everything is interlinked. Um, you, you, you know, you realize that the actual relay race is the most important thing and how the baton is handed from one department to the other. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the most important thing, the, the respect and the understanding um, and the reliance of one department onto the other. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have the most incredible, let's say from a fashion point of view, right? And you have the most incredible design, the most incredible collection, or the price points are amazing because the merchandise has done a great job, Bob, or the salesperson done it. And then the production, you know, don't. Or on the flip side, production's amazing, but the design's not that good. It's the wrong price or what? You know what I mean? And we, but we've got it there on time. It's amazing. You know, every, every single thing is... Um, Every single thing is intrinsically interlinked, and yeah. I think that that's that's something that um, the benefit of hindsight and experience is definitely something. Um, but also, I was also, I, I was quite, I was very inquisitive minded. Like I, I wouldn't stop. I'm, I'm extremely persistent. Like to the point of view, of, and you ask other people out of work, ask Baldo what he thinks about that. Um, like. In sales, it's a 21 year old kid in a showroom selling a collection. And then the, all, like, the buyers giving you different feedback on a collection. And then like you can just send that in a report or whatever, and that's it. And then you hope that next season those issues are fixed. But for me, I, I, like, I, I, that wasn't enough for me. Like I wanted... I wanted to be able to go and visit that person who come to that showroom in their hometown, take them out for dinner or whatever, and be able to explain to them and show them what's happening from the issues that they've had. Because the next time that they come into the showroom, there's no way that they were either not going to buy or, or reduce orders or, or whatever, because that was my job. And I hated failing at my job. I hated not reaching these objectives or tasks. So I wouldn't just stop in terms of like, so I, I used to make it my, you know, my my goal to make friends with the, the product development or production or whoever, you know, could help to get this through and improve the situation so that when it came to do my actual individual job, and this is I'm 22, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I think the inquisitiveness of not, um, of not like, giving up or, or like not taking things to the nth degree. I think that's definitely something that um, uh, in, in, in hindsight for people just starting out on the career is something that um, can't be underestimated. Mm. You know what I mean? Pick up the phone. I can't like, you know, it's, it's pick up the phone. Don't stop, you know? And even now I have it sometimes like, you know, Sometimes I'll just take, take take something, and if I'm on the phone and somebody's saying, "Oh, oh, they're in a meeting," or this, if it's something that I need at that time, that the team have been spending a lot of time, I, it's okay. I'll wait. So the meeting might be, like, "No, nah, it's okay for me. I'll wait." <laughs> and five minutes later, they'll come on the phone, and then we have a talk, and then it like, yeah, like you, 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 I don't know. The, 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 but I know I feel this in life as well at the moment. It's like the standards of people. Nobody gives a shit. In your home life and these things with the bills and utility and all, it, it's just like something's like weird in the world. I don't know if I'm the only one that feels this, but it's like, it's like I don't know, the standards and the technology has driven us all to like, you know, like we've got this excuse of, you know what, Simon? I think it's age. <laughs> Maybe I sound like one of these old like guys, you know, talking back and reflecting back. But I but think I, what happened, yeah, it's a com it's some, a conversation I have quite a lot. And I think as you get older and you see a lot more, you see a lot more sort of not not adhering to certain standards you just have seen more of the world and I think when you're younger you probably don't notice it as much and also you're probably more in your own world and creating you know having your own standards which are high 
And as you get to meet more people and see more of the world, it's just, it's more exposed. Right. However, I'll say something, uh, and I hope you don't think it's obnoxious, um, but uh, that persistence and that inquisitivity is probably the difference between a true talent and not. Do you know what I mean? So if you've instinctively got that kind of nature at 22 years of age, yep, you're probably going to be a CEO by the time you're 30, 35. Mm -hmm. but, the, but it's not rocket science. No. It really isn't. Like, I, I, I'm not the most intelligent person in the world by far, by a million miles at all. You know what I mean? I, I, in any way. So, like, however, you, you, like, you need to know your strengths and how you can use those strengths to impact things to the maximum. You know, and if you've got high standards and if you don't give up, then, yeah, generally you're going to be trust, trusted with more responsibility. It all starts from there, doesn't it? Well, it's like how do you go from not knowing something or not having something to then figuring it out, problem solving? You know, it's like it's not working or that person is not calling me back. Like what is a way around it? How can I do that instead of just accepting it as it is? If, if you don't have that... Um, if you don't innately have that, if one doesn't innately have that, you've got to ask your manager. Mm -hmm. Then, and if you're not getting it from your manager, go to your next manager. You, you just, you can't stop. You've got to be like, mm. like, in my I work on visualization a lot. I've done for a while. I used to visualize targets, this, that comes from football and things. Mm -hmm. And when you work on visualization, um, if you've seen something, it doesn't mean that you've had this hallucination of what that is. It means that it is, it, it, it it's 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 happened already. Mm -hmm. My life is there, it's done. You've smelt it, you've touched it, you've you've everything. So, so if powerful. Anything, if there's anything that is interrupting that or the speed and the time of when that's going to happen, <laughs> nope, nope. So you've got to. It, like water goes around obstacles, you just somehow you've got to find a way. And nobody's got any excuse. <laughs> now with Google and with everything, you can figure out anything. You know what oh, I mean? Absolutely. But you need also a, the culture of an organization, from a business perspective, the culture of an organization um, needs to facilitate that and also encourage and reward the people who are like that, who really care about getting something done and the standards of it. Because otherwise, that those people would get disillusioned. Mm. You know, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely, Simon. Mm. I have one last question for you, Go on. and I love asking this question because, and it's not my question. I always credit Mark Goulston, uh, Doctor Mark Goulston, for it. It's like, what seems impossible to you now, but if it were to happen, if you could make that happen, will change the course of your life or your business. I, I don't know if this is the right answer or not, but I don't think anything's impossible. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. But in terms of business right now, I'm doing two things. Uh, EcoAge, I'm the CEO of EcoAge, and then a personal project, which is uh, EBIT. And in both, with everything that we've got on the table, I don't think that anything is impossible at all. There's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of stuff that needs to go in your favor. There's a lot of stuff that you need to um, create the kinetic energy to go in your favor. But I don't think that anything's impossible. Maybe that's, I don't know. I love asking that question just to see, just to almost see your brain working and thinking and it's like, you know, entering that area. You know, what we need. Um, I'm thinking of what we need in in in, in Ida, um, and I don't. Yeah, you know, like in any business, in anything that anybody's doing, there's hurdles and there's different obstacles and there's different stuff going on. But um, I don't think that any of it's impossible at all. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. And also, we have very high ambitions in both. Um, but yeah. Well, Simon, what's the best way to reach you or EcoAge or your businesses? LinkedIn or Instagram, I guess. Yeah. 
Well, we'll link those in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Simon, such a pleasure. And I love talking to you and, you know, love hearing your story and you crying in the office, sharing your, you know, your your feelings and emotions and really connecting with people on a really, really deep level. And I think that's what makes you so special. And I'm really proud and really privileged to know you and to talk to you. And I really wish you all of the success in EcoAge. I think what, you know, we didn't actually discuss much about what you're doing there, but maybe it's another conversation for another day. But so I think this, it's... This is the thing, you know, you know me, Maria. I, I, I don't... I don't like, I, I don't do a lot of like, interviews. No, and I'm really <laughs> feel very, Unless very privileged that you've agreed to do yeah. this. Yeah, but I do this because I also respect you. And, you know, we've known each other for, for a long time. And I love how you've pivoted and that you're going into, uh, you know, you're doing more of more of this. So it's a pleasure to to, to, to talk to you and support you in this. And um, yeah, God bless you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Simon. <laughs> right. Speak to you soon, huh? Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. I hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world. Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.